Hello everybody, my name is Kara, and today I'm here with my March wrap-up. As with last month, uh, I will be filming this in two chunks, so hence the random outfit change that will probably happen halfway through this video. The first book I finished in March was Dangerous Alliance and Ostentatious Romance by Jenica Cohen. And in this book we follow our main character, Lady Victoria Aston, and after her sister um, is trying to escape a horrible abusive marriage, Victoria is now under the pressure to get married very quickly, which will have the effect of helping her sister get out of this abusive marriage and also um, keeping their family home and everything safe. And Victoria is a very free-spirited lady and she doesn't want to do this. Um, all she wants to do do is like run around and get dirty on her father's farm and she's also very passionate about the novels of Jane Austen so she's kind of trying to treat life as if it is a Jane Austen novel um, supposedly that's what she's doing and so the book is basically um, Victoria trying to help her sister work through this horrible thing that she has gone through and also kind of trying to get married but she also doesn't want to and then like her childhood best friend comes back into town who she's also had a crush on for a while and then things get messy because she ends up with multiple guys interested in her and she's not really sure how she feels about them and even the ones that she likes it's like she doesn't actually want to get married and she's kind of just being forced into it and and so that's the book. Um, I hated this. <laughs> really the only things I thought were well done in this book were um, the high stakes of the story, like the fact that Victoria's sister had been through this horrible thing. Like, not that I, you enjoy reading about that, but I kind of like the fact that this kind of romance story was grounded in something very real that women had really gone through. And I also found it very interesting to learn about the laws that were in place at this time and the marginal, you know, provisions that were made for women in abusive relationships. And I also thought that the main character got less stupid as the book got on. <laughs> Although honestly, I don't feel I don't feel like that's so much due to character development as like it's almost like the author just forgot that she was like making stupid choices at the beginning of the book because she was like quirky or high-spirited or spunky or something and then that just kind of stopped happening. So, I don't know. I got less annoyed with Victoria, but I don't think it's because she became a better person. And then everything else about this book I just hated. Um, Victoria as a main character, I already mentioned how frustrating she was. I also really hated the romance. Um, like the childhood friend like subplot is just, like that's not a trope I enjoy in the first place, but I also think their interactions were so not enjoyable and so not romantic. Like I, I don't understand because Victoria's interactions with this other romantic interest guy were so much more compelling than the ones that we were supposed to like ship her with to the point where like at the very end of the book it kind of felt like the author had to swoop in and destroy this other character's personality in order to make us believe that Victoria should end up with this other guy. Um, and I didn't like that. I didn't feel like it was well developed at all. I also hated the fake feminism in this book. Um, this book has a real like not like other girls problem and I just couldn't stand it. Like that's another reason I didn't like Victoria. Um, and then as part of that, this book's perspective on Jane Austen just infuriated me um, because we, we finished the book and clearly the message we are supposed to take away from this story is that it's stupid to expect real life to be like a frothy Jane Austen romance. And I just hated that because for one thing, like yes, there are romantic relationships in Jane Austen's books, but they're not, like the author and Victoria, the character was like treating these like treating it as if Jane Austen's books were just like pure fluffy wish fulfillment and that's not at all what they are like I thought I found that attitude so condescending and that's something that you expect to encounter from authors who don't like Jane Austen not necessarily from those who do and it just like really made me angry because it's like all of Jane Austen's happy endings are so hard fought for and so earned and like the women in these stories they go through so much and it's like are you telling me that because a woman is allowed to be happy in a book that makes it wish fulfillment like that seems to completely go against uh like victoria's story also there's a big like miscommunication subplot where like people just like not talking to each other it wasn't even miscommunication some of it it was just complete lack of communication i also just found the entirety of this book extremely unpleasant um i mean kind of from the summary it's like you know there's going to be that serious element of her sister's abusive marriage but the rest of the book, it's kind of like you're given to understand that it's going to be like kind of this fun, light rom-com, um, or at least that there's going to be some moments of like hope and fun. And I really didn't feel like that for most of this book. Like it was just like all of the subplots were so depressing, not just the one with Victoria's sister. Um, like the childhood friend subplot, like apparently his father was also abusive and like he walked in almost on like his father like sexually assaulting a maid. Like it just felt like there was so much dark content in this book and none of it was handled very well, um, with the possible exception of Victoria's sister's plot, although even that one I had kind of some issues with. I just really hated this. Um, and then to top everything off, the end of the book has the most like ridiculously dramatic climax and it's like an attempted rape scene that is sort of used as like a flirting opportunity because one of the male characters swoops in to save Victoria and it's like 
a, a moment for their cute banter and it's like she just escaped being raped how is how is this a romance moment i don't understand um i give dangerous lines two stars because i tend to save one stars for like actively harmful content but given some of the issues i had with this book um maybe it is closer to a one star next i finished wind witch by susan dennard this is the second book in the witchland series this is a fantasy series where i think everybody in this world or the majority of people in this world um are born with a different witchery or ability and uh safi the main character of the first book she is a truth witch um which is extremely sought after and very dangerous to have because like just picture any political fantasy that you've ever read and now imagine if one character has the ability to always tell when somebody is lying obviously everyone's going to be trying to get control of them and it's very dangerous for that character. So that's pretty much what happens in the first book. And then this book focuses more on the like consequences of the first book and how that has affected um, the different countries or kingdoms relationships with each other and also the different characters uh, that we meet in the first book. Um, like some of them are separated, some of them are forced to work together. I'm so glad I finally got back into the series. Um, there was no reason I waited so long because I absolutely loved Tooth Witch. I'm very impressed with how Susan Dennard managed to kind of summarize things and catch you up on the events of the first book, like right at the beginning of this one. Um, I feel like that was very like subtle and gave you enough detail for what was going on because I think it had been like three years since I read book one. And I also just love the characters in this series so, so much. Um, I think probably my biggest surprise from this book was Vivia because I have been hearing for a while that people really love Vivia and like they're, she's considered a lot of people's favorite characters. And after the events of book one, at least from what I remember, I didn't really like her that much or I had a hard time like sympathizing with her or understanding her but after this book I am fully on board the Vivia train like I love her as well um I also love spending time with Edwin and Assault they were antagonists in the first book kind of um and now they're sort of being forced to work together which is a trope that I love um and I just love all of their interactions another thing I love about this series is like all of the powers sound cool like there are some witcheries that I think I would enjoy more or that probably I think are considered um, more desirable or more rare by characters in the book. But you know how sometimes you read fantasies and like there's clearly one or two powers that are the coolest and then everything else is like a consolation prize? I never felt like that with this series. Um, I feel like all of these powers are so cool and so thoughtfully explored. So I just really, really enjoyed this book. Um, I gave it 4.5 stars instead of 5 stars like I did Truth Witch, just because based on my personal preference, I found certain plot elements slightly less compelling than the first book. Um, I know a lot of people complained about Safi and Assault being separated for this book, and I definitely see that point because their female friendship is one of my favorite things about the first book. But I also really liked that that gave us the opportunity to see more about who they were separately from each other um, and the way that they really love and care about each other and just support each other as friends so so much um like the way that when each of them are in danger they think about what the other would do it just like makes me so happy and emotional so i actually didn't mind that quite as much um i will say that i think merrick's storyline was the least compelling to me not because i didn't enjoy it but just because i liked the other characters more um and merrick even though i liked him in the first book he wasn't like one of my top tier of favorite characters but i still absolutely love this and i can't wait to continue the series next i finished the rose legacy by jessica de george this is the first book in a trilogy i can't remember the name of the trilogy um but this is a fantasy and we follow our main character anthea um and she's an orphan and she's kind of spent her whole life up to this point being shuffled around from different family members and then at the beginning of the book um she finally gets kicked out of her last family member's house basically um so she gets sent to live with i think like a distant uncle or something um on her mother's side that she's never met and they kind of live in exile or this region of the kingdom where like nobody really goes um like you pass this wall and you're not really supposed to go there and a very very few people live outside that wall so anthea is really scared about that um and she's especially scared because she's heard rumors that there are wild horses behind that wall um and in this fantasy world like the horses are believed to be the source of this really horrible plague that happened um like many years ago and because of this um horses were basically outlawed they were like um expelled from this society and they're kept like all this wall was built to keep everybody safe from them and everything so anthea is really scared to go to this horrible land of monsters but as you can probably tell from the cover of anthea riding a horse um she ends up changing her mind she starts realizing that the things that she was taught are not necessarily true um she starts finding out things about her family that she always was told were true that are actually not and i just really really enjoyed this book jessica de george is one of my favorite like cozy fantasy writers um which is not to say that there aren't high stakes in her books or that bad things don't happen because they do but they just have this feeling of comfort and safety and of i think one of the things i find so cozy about them is that the main characters 
are good people and they're trying to do the right thing. And that's something I also really loved in this book. Um, I really enjoyed seeing the development of different friendships. Um, one of my only actually complaints of this book is that there's a really great female friendship that I wish could have started earlier. Um, I understand why these two girls had a falling out, um, but I would have liked to see them like, I just would have liked to see them become friends earlier, honestly. Um, but I really enjoyed the side characters. There's the beginning of a very, very sweet, very subtle romance in the series that I really enjoyed. Um, and I just had such a good time reading this. This is exactly what I was in the mood for at the time. Um, I actually ended up picking this up because last minute I decided to participate in the fairy tale -thon, and I loved that. So I really enjoyed this and I gave it four stars. Next, I finished The Magnolia Sword, A Ballad of Mulan by Sherry Thomas. And I actually have a full spoiler-free review for this book, which hopefully has already been posted. This is an own voices retelling of the Mulan story that draws on the original legend as well as 5th century uh, Chinese history at that time and also on a specific genre of martial arts dramas. I just absolutely loved this. I loved Mulan as a main character. I loved the political like setting and the plot of this book and I just realized I didn't even tell you about the plot of this book. <laughs> so our main character is Mulan and her family. Um, every generation one of the people in her family has a sword fight with a with somebody in another family um, and over the years and generations this has kind of degenerated into um, a duel between these two families and Mulan is the latest in this long line of fighters um, and so she, a lot of her life has spent training for this and then right at the beginning of the book there's a draft for the army um, so that every single family is forced to give up one of their one of the men from their family and Mulan's father is very ill so she disguises herself as a boy and takes his place in the army and Mulan is very brave and a very good person but that doesn't necessarily mean that she wants to die fighting for this war that she doesn't really understand. So when she gets the opportunity to be part of the princeling's personal guard, she volunteers, thinking that this will keep her out of the fighting and she can return home to her family. And that's not exactly what ends up happening, um, because Mulan and the other characters start realizing that there are some political machinations going on behind the scenes, um, that, there more, that there may be more to this war than meets the eye. Mulan is such a compelling protagonist. She's so talented and competent and smart and brave and... Like, she makes mistakes, but as I mentioned in my review, um, one of the things I love about this book is that the conflict doesn't come from Mulan making stupid choices or, like, not being good at what she does. Um, it's just so refreshing to read a female character who is unapologetically good at what she does. And, like, the sword fight element is definitely important, but it doesn't take over the story, um, and neither does the politics, and neither does the developing relationship between Mulan and the prince character. Um, I just think this book was beautifully balanced. I gave the Magnolia Sword five stars. Next, I finished A Little Princess by Frances Hodgson Burnett. This was a buddy read with several of my friends, Kelly from Cozy Reader Kelly, Hannah from Snow White Reader, and Kier from Kier the Scrivener. Um, and I have read and loved The Secret Garden many times over the years, but I had never read this novel. We follow a little girl named Sarah Crew, um, and her father is very, very wealthy. And she's grown up with him in India, because um, this is during the time of uh, British colonialism in India. And at the beginning of this book, um, her father is bringing her to an English boarding school, and she's really upset about leaving him, but um, um, she decides to make the most of it and she's treated essentially as a princess by everybody at the school because she's so good and so rich and she has all these beautiful clothes and she has this wonderful imagination and then something terrible happens and suddenly Sarah is not wealthy anymore um, and the headmistress of the school uses this as an excuse because she never liked Sarah um, uses this as an excuse to turn her into a servant um, they overwork her they don't feed her and Sarah's life is just completely miserable now um, but throughout it all she tries to keep a positive attitude she relies on her imagination and her love for stories and she makes a few friends there as well. I try not to compare authors books too much but in this case it was really hard not to compare this to The Secret Garden. Um, Sarah as a main character I just found much less compelling than Mary Lennox. I mean Mary is like a horrible little brat at the beginning of her book but seeing her character arc throughout that book is just really really interesting and really compelling whereas with Sarah Crew I think like she was just so perfect and so sweet all the time and she was just so angelically good that there was nothing really like she had no flaws and even besides that she just didn't have a lot of personality in general um and i think part of that is because of the structure of the two books like the secret garden is really about the journey of mary like becoming a better person and kind of mirroring that of the garden coming back to life whereas with a little princess the fight or the conflict of this book is about can Sarah stay the same? Like, can she stay sweet and good and wonderful even in these terrible circumstances? Or was she just a good person because she had all of this wealth and privilege? And I think that's an interesting concept, but just from a story perspective, it's not as interesting to read that as a protagonist. Like, she's a very, very static character, and that's the point of this book, but it did make it less compelling for me. Um, I did enjoy the writing, I just really liked the way that Frances Hudson Burnett tells stories, 
and I really liked the focus on storytelling and imagination and those things, um, those things mattering. There's also the fact that because of when this book was written, there are some really not great attitudes about people of color, um, Indians especially, that were just very uncomfortable to read, and those are definitely present in The Secret Garden, um, but I found them a little more uncomfortable in this book because with The Secret Garden it's like, Mary says some like really awful things about the native Indians that she knew um, before she moved to Mistlethwaite Manor, even though the book definitely doesn't acknowledge that they're wrong in so many words, those things are directly linked with Mary being not a nice person, and as she becomes a nicer person those things like fade out of the book basically, like those racial like slurs and insults, which is not to say that they're well handled, that's not what I'm getting at, but at least there was some acknowledgement that what Mary was saying was wrong just by the fact that when she became a nicer person she didn't say those things anymore. Whereas with The Little Princess there was none of that, um, it was pretty much consistently through the story, so that was another thing I didn't love about it, um, but I did really like some scenes of this book, and the ending in particular I just really really loved, um, it really got to me like emotionally. The last chapter in particular, my eyes definitely teared up a bit at the end, and I gave A Little Princess 3.5 stars. Next I finished The Navigator by Erin Michelle Skye and Stephen Brown. This is the second book in the Wendy, or the Tales of the Wendy series, um, and this is a retelling of Peter Pan, and our main character is Wendy. And in the first book Wendy is serving in the military of England and in this special branch that is basically like the magic branch, um, because in this in this alternate history world um, England is kind of at war with these creatures called Everlost, I think. Um, basically there's this magical threat facing England and they have this special branch of their military dedicated to fighting it, and that's what Wendy is a part of in the first book. And then in the second book she and some of the other characters have made their way onto a ship that is actually trying to get to where the Everlost come from, so Neverland essentially, and Wendy is one of the only characters who doesn't necessarily believe that Peter Pan, um, one of the I guess villains or antagonists from the first book, and she doesn't believe that he is the source of all of the attacks that England and the military are facing, um, and she's one of the only people who believes this, so she kind of has her own agenda that she's trying to pursue in addition to serving honorably on this ship. So she has a lot of kind of conflicting loyalties that I found very interesting because she's definitely a very moral person, and she's also very, um, she definitely does want to do the right thing for her country in addition to following uh, what her own conscience tells her. So I just found that very compelling and very interesting. Um, I really love Wendy as a main character, and I really love the writing of this book. Um, it's very like fairy tale humor, like tongue in cheek. Um, it's very self aware, I think, and not in a way that got to be too much. And I'm also really enjoying the development of the various characters in this book, um, especially Wendy and also Captain Hook a little bit, um, who he's he's a very different character than in the like traditional story that I think a lot of people know, but he can still be extremely unlikable. So I'm very interested to see where the authors go with his character. Like, I find him very interesting. I'm still not completely sold on him because of some of the irritating, sexist things he does, but. I'm interested to see where his character ends up, um, and I really really love the introduction of Tiger Lilia, who is the equivalent of Tiger Lily from the original story, which I think the authors made a very smart decision in changing that part of the story, because that is a very racist part of the original book that we don't need to carry into retellings or anything. Um, so I really like the way they addressed that, and I just really enjoyed this as a sequel. I think overall um, the direction or the plot of this book I found a little bit less compelling for me than the first one, but that's more because I was not expecting the direction this one went, and because a substantial part of the like first half of this book is spent on a ship trying to get to Neverland, and I just tend not to like books that take place on ships. But even considering that, I just really enjoyed this as a sequel, and I gave The Navigator four stars, and I think the third book should be coming out sometime this year, and I'm very very excited about it. Next I finished Bo and Bet by Catherine Burla, a modern retelling of Beauty and the Beast, um, and that is exactly what this book is. It takes place in California, and instead of a mansion, um, it takes place on this really wealthy uh, ranch in California, and the Beast character is actually female, and her name is Bettina, and she's really beautiful and um, very wealthy, very well off, but she's not very popular at school. And the Beauty character is this boy named Bo, um, who is definitely from a lower income family, and something happens where his mother gets in trouble on the property of Bettina, and in exchange um, Bo volunteers to go and work on this ranch um, every weekend for I think a month or something like that, and while he's there uh, Bettina and Bo start getting to know each other, they start becoming interested in each other, and the story is basically about their developing relationship and romance. And this was like a very middle of the road book for me. I liked the idea and some of the ways that that idea was interpreted, like setting a Beauty and the Beast retelling in modern California on this really wealthy ranch, I thought that was very interesting. I thought it was hilarious that instead of plucking a rose, what Bo's mother did was she stole an avocado from this like wealthy avocado ranch, because I live in California and we do love our avocados. And I also really liked the exploration of um, the ways that we view popular girls and the ways that we view, um, like the reasons that we start to see women especially as being 
uh, stuck up or rude or cruel, like the things that they do versus the things that men can do and how like we perceive those differently. Um, I don't think that was quite dealt with thoroughly in this book, but that was an interesting idea. The other characters I found pretty flat, so I didn't really mind that we didn't spend a lot of time with them. Um, but yeah, this was just kind of okay. Like the writing was this really weird mix of rambly and distancing. It wasn't until like finishing the book or like writing my review on Goodreads that I was like, I have no idea anything about Bo as a person. <laughs> um, I feel like Bettina we know slightly more, but like Bo, it's like he's kind of a blank slate. But all that being said, I still was like kind of invested in this book. I always wanted to pick it up and read it, and I was actually invested in the relationship between Bettina and Bo. I ended up giving it three stars, so like this was fine. It wasn't my favorite, but I did care, but I didn't care that much. So it was a mixed bag. Next, I finished East by Edith Patel. This is a fairy tale retelling of East of the Sun, West of the Moon. And we follow our main character, Rose, and she has always been an adventurer. Um, she wants to go out and explore the world, and her mother is really afraid about that. She always tries to protect her and keep her close to home, but then one day Rose gets the opportunity to finally go on an adventure when a polar bear shows up at their family cottage and asks for Rose to come with him, and in exchange he will help save her family. Rose takes him up on this, and she goes with him, and then the rest of the book is about um, when she's at the, the bear's castle and trying to figure out what's going on. Um, she starts suspecting that there's something magical going on, some kind of spell or curse, and she has to try and figure out like what that is. I was really surprised for some reason that this book was multiple point of view, but I actually really liked that. Um, I found it very engaging, and while Rose was an okay main character, um, I didn't love her enough that I would have wanted to be her in her head the entire time. Um, I think that would have gotten kind of repetitive because she kind of spent most of the book wanting the same things, um, which is understandable, but I just think it was a smart move on the author's part to have um, different perspectives scattered in, like from some of her brothers or from her mother, also from the antagonist character. I also thought the setup of this book was really interesting and really well done. Um, I found sometimes that with fairy tale retellings or retellings of other well-known stories, the beginning part can be kind of slow sometimes or a little bit of a drag to get through because you're just trying to get to the point where you know the story is going to start. Um, and this one I didn't feel like it did that. Like it went really quick and I think part of that is because of the multiple point of view. The chapters were very short. Um, I was instantly very engaged in this book. I liked the world building in general. I found it a really interesting um, kind of magical fairy tale but mostly historical kind of setting. I did end up kind of disappointed in this book though. And part of it is that I'm wondering if retellings of this fairy tale just aren't for me because um, I've read a couple now that have left me wanting more in the, especially in the character development and the romance department, um, because this is a fairy tale that is kind of centered around a romantic relationship, and I just haven't found it very convincing or compelling, and unfortunately this one was no different. I also really didn't like, um, there's this big chunk of the book near the end that's basically a survival story, um, kind of. It's like Rose is traveling with um, another person who's like helping her navigate this like frozen tundra. And some of it was interesting, but we spent a long time on that and I just personally don't enjoy survival stories, so that's definitely a me thing, not necessarily like the book was bad for that reason. And I also kind of felt like some of the really upsetting or emotional parts were glossed over just a little bit in this book. Um, like a lot of a lot of parts of the story were just plain unpleasant to read, which is fine, but I think that those things got wrapped up a little quickly. So I ended up giving East 3.5 stars. Next, I finished A Mixture of Mischief by Anna Mariano. This is the third and final book in the Love Sugar Magic trilogy, and I buddy read this with my friend Priscilla from Bookie Charm, and I am so glad we did. Um, we really agreed that this is exactly what we needed at the moment with everything going on, um, and I loved this book. In the first one, we follow our main character Leonora, and her and her family are a family of cooking witches. And in the first book, she finds that out and decides that she doesn't want to wait around until she's old enough to be trained in cooking magic. Um, she wants to figure it out for herself and some problems ensue from there. And this book deals a lot more with the family as a whole and with the uh, with her family bakery and also with one of Leo's family members. And Leo trying to figure out what they want and if her and her family have to like protect themselves against this person. Um, I can't say any more because of spoiler reasons, but I just loved this book. Um, I don't know if book two or three is my favorite, but I love them both so much. Um, this series is just it has such wonderful family relationships, and I really loved seeing in this book how far Leo has come since book one. Um, we see her actually talking to people when she has problems. Um, like, there are still times where she wants to solve problems by herself, but I think overall she's gotten a lot better about opening up to her family. Um, and this book, it, it was interesting because in this book it's much more about Leo's parents realizing that their kids are 
mature enough to hear about the problems they're going through. Um, and I just thought that was really beautifully done. I just love Lalo's family in general. That's always been one of my favorite parts of this series is how close this family is. And even though they fight and disagree, um, they're always there for each other. And her and her sisters just have a beautiful relationship. And her parents too are wonderful and her extended family too. I just love how tight knit this family is. I also loved the expansion of the magic in this book. Um, and especially how that related to the themes of women's history and how we hand down stories about women. There were some new characters introduced who I really loved, um, like Leo's cousin JP comes into town and I wasn't sure how I'd feel about him at first. I was kind of like, I'm happy with my core group of characters, but he ended up being like a highlight of the book for me. I just found him so fun and engaging. We also have some really casual representation here, like JP is diabetic and that was just really nice to see that in a kid's book and it like wasn't a big deal. And then speaking of the themes I mentioned earlier, um, that's something, that's another thing I have consistently loved in this series. Here we deal, besides the women's history that I talked about, um, we deal with themes of family, with themes of responsibility, and especially the responsibility of power and doing the right thing. And there are even important topics discussed that aren't quite so intrinsic to the story. There are several references to things like colorism or colonialism, and even though those aren't like the main focus of the story, um, to see them worked into a children's story in such a casual and subtle way was just really wonderful, and I gave a mixture of mischief five stars. Next, I finished Strange the Dreamer by Lainey Taylor. Uh, finally, <laughs> after meaning to read this book for how many years now, I was actually a guest co-host for the live show for this round of Voltathon. So thank you, Margaret, again for having me. I will link that live show down below where we all talk about this book. Um, and I feel like everybody on booktube like knows the synopsis of this. So I'm just going to be very brief about it. Um, our main character is Laszlo Strange and he has been obsessed with this lost city called Weep and nobody knows what the real name of the city is. Um, and after a while, people even kind of forget that the city existed um, or they're not interested in it anymore. And Laszlo is the only one who still really cares. And one day he gets the opportunity to try and go and find that city of Weep. And the rest of the book is about what happens when he gets there and some other characters that actually live in the city of Weep. And unfortunately, I really, really didn't like this. Um, I'm starting to realize, sorry if you can hear the sirens, um, I'm starting to realize that Lainey Taylor's later books are not working for me as well as her earlier ones did. Um, my favorite books of hers are still um, the Dream Dark series. I think some of the ideas of this book were interesting, like the importance of storytelling and fairy tales. Um, that's something I really enjoyed. I also kind of liked some of the themes about the book, um, especially with war and responsibility and revenge versus forgiveness and how that relates to healing. And Laszlo as a main character, I kind of liked him. He was fine. I liked the idea of him. Um, execution wise, he wasn't super engaging just because I feel like he was so focused on this lost city of Weep and I as the reader did not care about the lost city of Weep. Um, so it was kind of hard to get invested in his character when so much of his focus was on a thing that I didn't really care about. And then I also really liked um, a few of the side characters. I can't remember anybody's names now. I think it was Calixte, Errol Fane, and, and Azima, something like that. Um, those three I found really interesting. I thought they had the most interesting characters and some of the best dialogue in the book. Um, other than that, I didn't really care about anyone in this story. And I think a big part of that is the writing style. I really don't like the way that Lainey Taylor writes. I find her to be really overwritten, like so flowery to the point where I couldn't even tell what things were supposed to look like. Like the longer she described a setting, the less I knew what it was. Um, and then the same thing with characters. Like she would get so caught up in the aesthetic of the story she was telling that I had no idea um, what made these characters tick. I didn't care about their interactions or their relationships. I also feel like her dialogue felt really forced a lot of the times. Um, like there would be like entire conversations that were clearly just set up so that Laszlo could have like a funny one-liner. And while those were sometimes funny, um, I just feel like as a whole, the dialogue didn't do a lot for me except for those characters I already mentioned. Also, I really did not like the other main character of this book. Um, and not so much an active dislike as like, a complete apathy and lack of interest in Sarai. I did not care what happened to her. Um, and Laszlo I, I liked a little more because his like his whole librarian thing I found more interesting because, you know, book lover. Um, but Sarai had no personality. Um, I thought her power was like kind of interesting, but that's even though that's something that I tend to really like in books, her particular power, like that's a that's a story element I tend to enjoy. I didn't really care about it in this one because Sarai as a character herself, I just didn't care about. And then speaking of Sarai, um, I hated the romance in this book. It was so over the top. Once again, it was very overwritten. Like all of their interactions were just buried under all of this overwrought language and they didn't feel like real people interacting. And unfortunately the romance is a really central part of this book. And then also the mystery, um, or there's several mysteries in this book. 
I found them either predictable or uninteresting. And I think the mystery wouldn't have been as disappointing if so much of this book hadn't been built around you not knowing what was going on. Um, because if you did know what was going on, like I did for some of it, or also like if you just didn't really care about one of the reveals, it was really hard to force myself through this book. So unfortunately, um, I did not like this book. I'm glad I finally read it after meaning to for so long. And I gave Strange the Dreamer two stars. Next, I finished A Field Guide to Irish Fairies by Bob Curran, illustrated by Andrew Whitson. Um, and this is just a very short, um, fun book about different kinds of fairies in Ireland um, and they would have like sh really short chapters on each of them with some illustrations and um, like different like folklore. Some of them were like specific stories about them and some of them were about like um, general folklore involving the the different creatures and I liked this. I thought this was fun. The illustration style was not quite my thing um, but I think it you know it was effective enough. I really enjoy fairy tales and that kind of thing so it was really enjoyable to read about some of the ones that are specific to Ireland or to different parts of Ireland um, so I had fun with this and I gave it 3.5 stars. Next I finished Wild's Women by Eleanor Fitzsimons, How Oscar Wilde Was Shaped by the Women He Knew. This is a nonfiction book and I actually already have a full uh, review posted for this so I will link that down below if you want more information. In this book we look at um, several important women in Oscar Wilde's life and how those really shaped him, shaped his personality and his values and his interests. Um, like one of the ones that is covered quite a bit is his mother and I found that very interesting. I also really liked the sections about Constance, his wife. I will say this book was a little over detailed sometimes but conversely some of my favorite parts were little side stories that I found really interesting. There might be some sections where you think the detail is just right and some where you felt like it was too much which is kind of what happened with me. I also want to mention that this book spoils quite a few of Oscar Wilde's works, um, even some of the lesser known ones like his fairy tales but definitely a lot of his plays. And another thing that I forgot to mention in my review actually is I really liked how this book um, it gave us a picture of Oscar's personality because of course there are all these things written about what a brilliant um, artist he was, like how clever and smart he was, um, and of course about his famous and infamous reputation. So we do get that side of him but we also focused a lot more on um, who he was as a person, like the fact that he was a really kind and generous friend. There were some descriptions especially of ways that he would help out his friends that I just found really wonderful um, and it was nice to get that more like personal side of him. And I gave Wild Women 3.5 stars. Next I finished A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens and this was a buddy read with my friend Nina from Corners of a Bookshelf and I will link her down below as well. Um, and this is pretty well known. Um, it's a story set during the French Revolution. We follow French aristocrat Charles Darnay and his wife Lucy um, and their lives together in England and then Sidney Carton is kind of the other main character. I think arguably the protagonist of this book. These characters end up getting tangled up in the violence of the French Revolution um, and everything that kind of goes from there. Um, one thing that was really interesting about this book is I realized I actually knew very little about the story of A Tale of Two Cities. I watched the movie years ago in high school and I remember enjoying it and I knew like the basic premise and I knew the ending and I knew some of the big events. But other than that, I really didn't know much about what this book was actually about. This book was a really pleasant surprise for me. Um, I've had bad luck with Charles Dickens so far. Like I've read two other books of his, three, two, I don't remember, um, and I didn't like either of them. And this one, I just really loved. Now there are a lot of problems I have with this book <laughs> um, and things that should have made me enjoy it a lot less than I did. Um, like I do think Charles Dickens goes way overboard with descriptions. The beginning was especially really slow because we're spending it um, with this character who doesn't seem important for the longest time uh, and it's just like describing his journey in a carriage for like how many pages was it? A long time in excruciating detail and I was like who is this guy? Why do we care? Why are we spending so much time on this? And then you realize why. So it does eventually come together but I think some of those descriptions could have been cut or shortened quite a bit. Also there's a character named Jerry who I feel like we were supposed to really like and find him like really comical. I kind of hated him. Um, I really didn't like any scenes with him and I really didn't like the way that he treated his wife. Also Lucy as like the main female character um, she had no personality. Like <laughs> she really was just a plot device. But I think the reason that didn't bother me more is for one thing, um, there were other female characters in the book who I found much more interesting, um, like her governess or her kind of servant. I really, really liked her character actually. And also I feel like it was pretty even handed when it came to the different characters because Lucy and Charles, I personally think had very little personality. So it wasn't like just the women weren't interesting. Because in my opinion, I think this book is really about Sydney. It's about Sydney Carton's character and development and like this book is really about him and his choices. And when I read it through that lens, it makes a lot more sense that so many of the other characters um, don't get a lot of development, like Lucy and Charles's relationship especially. They're important because they're important to Sydney, 
not so much that like they're really the main characters of this book. I also ended up really loving the writing. Um, for some reason it took me a really long time to get into it because even though I read quite a few classics there's something about Charles Dickens style, I don't know if it's his sentence structure or what, that really bogs me down and it took me a long time to get used to that. Um, but once I did get used to it and once we kind of moved out of the really description heavy parts and we started getting into more characters and character interactions I actually really loved the way he wrote. Um, his dialogue is stellar. Like it is so funny. <laughs> um, that was another thing is I did not expect this book to be as funny as it was in places. I also really liked um, the perspective on the French Revolution. I actually talked about this last month when I read another book set during the French Revolution, um, but I feel like for the most part Charles Dickens did a good job of staying, I don't want to say neutral, but kind of equally compassionate. Like he was very upfront about how awfully the poor people of France were treated. Um, he didn't pull any punches when it came to talking about what the aristocrats and the wealthy people did. But at the same time, you were clearly allowed or even intended to feel sympathy for some of the things that the people ended up doing um, once they revolted. And I really loved some of the themes in this book about um, selflessness and love and bravery and responsibility and hope. Like the themes of this book really really got me and especially how they related to Sydney um, because Sydney is my favorite part of this book. Even with all of the problems I talked about earlier, I gave this book five stars because I just love Sydney Carton so much and I love his arc so much and the end of this book made me sob. Like I was finishing this at like two o'clock in the morning, tears streaming down my face, even though like I knew the ending and I knew what was coming. I just, like his character development is so so good and it was very very emotional. So yeah, this is one of those five star books where it's not flawless, like it definitely isn't flawless, but all of the things that I loved about it were so good that they made up for the things that I didn't love as much. Next I finished The Fellowship of the Ring by J.R.R. Tolkien. This is of course the first part in the Lord of the Rings trilogy and I'm reading the whole series as a buddy read with my lovely friends Vendi from Caught Between Pages, Katie from A Sea of Toms, and Kelsey from Hardback Haven. And technically this is a reread for me but it almost doesn't feel like one because the last time I read this was I think 16 years ago? It's been a while, but we follow Frodo primarily, um, and he's a hobbit who lives in the Shire, and he ends up in possession of the Ring of Power, um, and because of this he realizes that he's going to have to go on a quest to destroy it or to get rid of it um, in order to protect the people he cares about and just um, the world of Middle-earth in general. So he teams up with a fellowship, um, you know, a bunch of different characters, and this first book is primarily about the early part of their journey, and it feels very weird to summarize this book because not only is it hard to summarize things that are very well known, but also like yes that is the plot, but the important parts of this book for me were not so much related to that. Like I knew going in that I was going to like this book, I remembered liking it when I read it a long time ago, and I love the movies, but I was really shocked by how much I love this book. Like I know a lot of people talk about how um, slow and over descriptive the writing is, and I can definitely see that, it is at times, but for the most part I feel like it's used to good purpose. Like Tolkien really paints this beautiful picture of the scenery or um, he gives you a real sense of where these characters are or how they interact with each other or like the backstory, like the history of this world. Um, his world building I think is just incredible. A lot of people, even people who don't like his books, acknowledge him as like one of the founders of fantasy as a genre. But I think sometimes that can kind of get turned into like, oh well he was only successful because nobody else had done it before. Like basically that he's not really a good storyteller in his own right, and I don't think that's true. Like I really really love the way he builds his worlds. Um, I love his characters, and that was another thing that surprised me, because um, Frodo, the main character, has always been one of my least favorites from the movie. Like I didn't dislike him, and I think Elijah Wood did a really great job of playing him, but compared to the other characters I love, he just never did a lot for me. But in this book, I love Frodo, like he might be one of my favorites, and I think it's because all of the things that I love about Frodo are internal. Um, like they're the choices that he makes and the things that he d that he thinks about or that he like that are important to him. Um, like his inner life is what really draws me to him and makes me love him. Um, and he's just he's so brave. And like that's another thing I love about this book is that so much of it is about the bravery of ordinary people. And you guys know that's something I love in books as a theme. So maybe I should have expected I would love this book more. There's this part near the very beginning of the book where Frodo is realizing that he has like the Ring of Power and he's gonna have to leave his home and everybody he knows basically um, to go and destroy it. And he doesn't for a second consider saving himself instead. Like at this point Gandalf hasn't even really told him what he has to do or asked him to do it. And Frodo of his own volition says like, 
well, I'm going to miss everyone. Like, this is going to be really hard leaving behind the people I care about and my home that is really comfortable and all of this. Like, it doesn't even occur to him to not do the right thing. And I feel like that's a recurring theme with a lot of these characters. And I just, I love that so much. Which is not to say that they don't struggle to do the right thing, because they definitely do sometimes. The conflict of this book isn't from people not caring enough. And that's something that I really enjoyed. This was another classic that was a lot funnier <laughs> than I thought it was going to be. Um, like some of the dialogue and the character interactions is just this very subtle, dry humor that I absolutely loved. And there's this one quotation that really struck me. It's very close to the beginning of the book. And at this point, Frodo is realizing what he is going to have to do, that he's going to have this responsibility. And Gandalf says, always after a defeat and a respite, the shadow takes another shape and grows again. I wish it need not have happened in my time, said Frodo. So do I, said Gandalf, and so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us." I just found that really beautiful, um, really inspiring and indicative of this book and all of the feelings it gave me. So yeah, this was another surprise. Um, I gave The Fellowship of the Ring five stars. I was expecting to enjoy it and I came away with like, oh, I guess this book is just like a part of my soul now. Okay. <laughs> and finally, the last book I finished in March was Glory Happening. Finding the Divine in Everyday Places by Caitlin B. Curtis. This is a Christian nonfiction book, and I also did this one as a buddy read with my friend Margaret from The Word Nerd. Um, we kind of were loosely scheduling it because, because scheduling has been a little bit wild for basically everybody, but I really liked doing this as kind of a casual buddy read. Um, I think this is a book that lends itself really well to taking it slow and to discussing it with people um, and to really letting it sink in. It's about finding parts of the divine in very everyday, ordinary things. Um, and that was a focus that really appealed to me. And I feel like I'm pretty good at enjoying small things, like the small things in life, but not so good at using those to stop worrying about the future, if that makes sense. Um, so that was one of the things I was really hoping to get better at from this book. And I do feel like it really helped. Um, there were some chapters especially where it's like, with everything happening in the world right now, I'm really glad I'm reading this book at the same time. This book is essentially a series of very short essays, and each of them is focused on a different topic. Um, a lot of them are personal stories from Caitlin Curtis and one of the things I loved about this book is that the chapters that meant the most to me were not necessarily the ones that I had personal experience with um, which I thought was really cool like one of the chapters that surprised me with how much I loved it and with how much it got to me was about her taking her sons to a community garden I think like that's not something I've experienced that's not something I expected to have a strong connection to but the ways that she draws these connections and the way that she talks about these topics um, it makes it possible to really connect to things even that we haven't experienced. Quite a few of these chapters made a real impression on me, um, and I also think Caitlin B. Curtis is really great at writing her own prayers slash poems or like meditations at the end of each um, chapter of this book, and like that's a real skill because not everybody is good at writing them in a way that has beauty and also meaning and that doesn't feel almost like performative, if that makes sense. And I feel like she did a really great job with those. I really enjoyed the ones that she wrote. So overall, I really enjoyed this. Um, if this is a topic that you're interested in, I would definitely recommend it. And I gave Glory Happening 4.5 stars. Okay, everybody. So those are all of the books that I read in March. Please let me know if you have read any of them, what you thought of them, or if you're going to pick them up. Thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you soon with another video, and I hope you love the next book you read. Bye.